Did I hear the bell? Did you ding ding it? Mike. He's not wearing his hearing aids. It's a Y'all didn't know we hired a comedian. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Cornelius. My name is Diana Sharp, and I'm so glad to see everybody this morning. I'm so excited to be here in the house of the Lord and worship him today. In the pew pockets are the Baptist Faith and Message. If you'd like to take one, if you're a visitor, we'd like for you to fill out that card, share whatever information you'd like to share, and drop it in the offering plate in the back. In your bulletin are many inserts. The first one is a um, Vacation Bible School insert. If you would like to help in any way, you can just look at this at your perusal. Just uh, follow the directions or see the pastor if it doesn't make sense to you. But everything's pretty self-explanatory. On Tuesday will be our church council meeting. Starts at 6.30. Um, all council members are required to be here, please. And church members are invited. Anybody's welcome to come. Next Sunday, right after the... the um, worship service, we will have a quarterly business meeting. You'll want to be here. Um, we're going to talk about the newly selected deacons, and we're going to, I guess, induct new members or add new members. Well, there might be after today. Okay. Got to have the faith. Uh, he's got more faith, let me tell you. All right, then... Then there's an insert here where we're going to do some fundraising and stuff for an air conditioner and different things if you just look that over any way you would like to help. On June 26th, we're so excited. We're going to have our combined worship service with the four churches. That's um, also in the bulletin here. You'll want to come to that, bring your favorite food that you'd like to share. And it's going to be a big day. On Tuesdays at 10 o'clock, we have our prayer warriors that meet back here. If you have any special requests, you can get that to Miss May. She's sitting over here today. Raise your hand. This is May Davis, you guys, and she's over that. Or if you would like to come and pray with us, we'd love to have you. At 7 a.m. on Wednesday, the, men's, the men have their prayer breakfast. Uh, you bring your own breakfast, but they supply all the coffee. And I guess it's a fun time, but it's a... You know, men's club, so I wouldn't know. I'm teasing. We need to get a women's thing together, amen? Yes, we do. At 2 and 6.30 on Wednesdays are the um, Bible studies that are offered here, and they're also offered on Zoom. At 7.30, we meet in here for the praise team rehearsal. Um, we would love to have you come if you'd like to make a joyful noise. I think that's all the announcements that... Oh, gosh. The cornhole tournament's today, y'all. You want to go to that? What it's time? It's at 2.30. 2.30 at Williams Place. And we're, we're short a few people, so we need help. Even if you don't want to play, just go and watch. It's, so, it's, it's very fun. I want to say entertaining. <laughs> Anything else? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. I shall shut up now. Good morning, everybody. Oh, you can do better than that. Let me try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, that's better. Let's stand. What, what are we doing here this morning? We have come here to do what? We're to worship. Let's sing about that. Come, now is the time to worship. Here we go. Now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day 
every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. And all God's people said, Amen. You be seated. Kids, come on up. Come on up. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hello, hello. So, let me ask you a question. Do you think we could feed 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish? 5,000 people. Plus kids and women, so maybe 20,000 people. No? <clears throat> Don't think so? Don't think so? The disciples didn't think so either. They uh, uh, were with Jesus one day, and there was a whole crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children. Some people thought there might have been as many as 20,000 people. And all they had was five loaves and two fish. And so they wanted to make the people go away. They, they saw a problem that they couldn't solve, so they wanted to make it go away. Jesus said, you should feed them. And uh, they began to argue with them and said, well, hey, we only got five loaves and two fish, and uh, there's 5,000 plus people. There's no way this is going to work. And so Jesus says, give me the fish. Give me the loaves. And then Jesus gives praise to God and hands the fish and the loaves back to him and says, go ahead and feed them. And the disciples this time listen are obedient. And you know what? They feed all the people with just five loaves and two fish. It's a miracle. All right, and then they even have 12 baskets of fish and bread left over, right? All from that. Yeah, what? Yeah, what? Yeah. Yeah, no, it wasn't slicing it two little bitty pieces either. That's a good point. No, everybody ate until they were full, okay? It was truly a miracle of Jesus, and that's the lesson, right? Sometimes we look at what we have and we think to ourselves, well, we just can't solve the problem. We don't have the resources. We don't have the bread or the money or whatever we don't have. But if we rely on Jesus to supply what we need, then he will do the miracle through us. See, if we try to do it in our own strength, we'll fail. But if we do it in the strength of Jesus, we will be successful. And we'll have more than enough. And that's the lesson for today. So remember that. Don't try to rely on your own strength. Rely on the strength of Jesus. All right, Luke, you want to come over here and pray with me, please? Thank you, sir. Jump. All right, good job. All right, let's say our prayers. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these little children, Lord, and I pray that these messages uh, will get through to their hearts. Lord God, Father, let them know that you are more than enough, that anything that we may need or anything that we may be able to do in your name will be accomplished through you and your Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, who works through us to do miracles. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, guys, go have a good lesson.
Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good to be in the house of the Lord today. I believe summer is finally here. <laughs> this, uh, it's nice in here with the air conditioning. Just a little hint, we do need a little help with the air conditioning, too. <laughs> um, on the back of the, your bulletin, you'll see the prayers and praises from last week. And also, you'll see my uh, email address. If you'd like to email me with your email, I'd be glad to put you on our prayer list. Or if you have a concern, uh, let me know and I can list it. Those on Facebook... We're glad you joined us, and uh, please put something in the chat column so we can converse back and forth with you if you have a concern. Uh, the same thing, we can put it on the prayer list. Um, I don't have a whole lot today. All I, so far, I have a prayer for Elizabeth Choplin, who is still... Okay. Um, her cancer cells have shrunk a little bit. Okay, good. Um, she goes back in for chemo tomorrow. Okay. And they're hoping that they, they've tweaked her treatment a little bit, so they hope it's not quite as difficult for her. So. Okay. All right. Well, we'll continue to pray for her and her treatment as she goes forward. Um, praise for this church, praise for all churches, a praise for our freedom, praise that we can come in here with free spirits and be able to worship God and to fellowship with one another, um, something we should never take for granted. And I have a praise, that better late than never, I, I've been meaning to do this every week, a praise for David Roche, um, praise that you're here. Um, through the <laughs> we believe through the works of God you're here. <laughs> Terry wanted to uh, retire, and uh, there was nobody there. And coincidence that David came back to North Carolina. Coincidence that uh, he could come back here, and. Uh, we are just so delighted that you're here. I, myself, I just didn't want that to go by another week without saying how happy we are that you're here. Um, are there any other prayer requests or praise? Yes. Todd. Okay. Okay, Todd and his son. Okay. Right. They weren't able to get the, uh, hopefully the whole tumor, can't the oh. tumor. So she had two surgeries back to back. So she's weak, but um, I think she'll, she'll be okay. We've okay. got a lot of prayers going. Okay, and that's your cousin? Yes. Okay. Johnson. Jan's cousin, Beth Johnson. Johnson, in case you couldn't hear, had two surgeries to remove uh, cancerous tumors. Okay, anybody? Uh, um, yeah. We've prayed for my friend Paul numerous times. Right. And tomorrow is his last radiation treatment. Uh huh. And he's really struggled the last few days. And so I just pray that he makes it tomorrow and that the cancer is gone so that he gets oh, his strength back. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, that was Shar's friend Paul, who has the last treatment of radiation tomorrow. Hopefully the cancer's gone, he gets his strength back. This has been quite a while. Yes, Diana. I have a high school friend named Stoney Bowers. His son, Trevor, was killed on a motorcycle a couple nights ago by a drunk driver. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Sorry to hear that. I got a phrase. Oh, good. Uh, Let's hear the uh, phrase. Friend Ross, he comes to church. Yes, he yes. Crutches, but uh, he got in a lot of pain. I think he's got multiple sclerosis and uh -huh. sciatica or something. Uh, he got several nerve issues, and they took him to the hospital in a lot of pain last Monday. And 
he had read about a treatment called Marinol, an uh, experimental drug, and uh, they're giving that to him. And he's, uh, he's, he's like in wonderful spirits right now. Oh, good, 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 good. We'll continue to pray for that. Good, yeah, we miss him. Tell him when you see him, we miss him. Yeah, he, he likes, loves everybody. He's yes, there. good. Okay, anybody else? Did I miss anybody? Roberta? Kathy's going to be flying this week. Well, that I want to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Travel mercies for Kathy, yeah. Okay. Seeing no more, I will ask, does anybody have spoken prayers? <laughs> We're going to get there. <laughs> if so, let's bring them all to the Father. Dear Father, we come before you to give you all the thanks you so deserve for all you've done for us, for all you do for us, for all the promises you've made to us, for the hope you give us. We come before you, lift up names and circumstances, and, and we lift up this world to you. Um, we lift up the violence, the, the bad, the ugly, and ask, please help us know how to make this world a better place. We're only just one person, but just one person can make a difference. Please show us the way that we can share your love with others to make this world a better place. We thank you for Jesus, who through him we can come to you and be righteous and blameless, and you listen to us, and just knowing that that you hear us and is just give us hope. We pray that the people that we're praying for will come to know you better and know you as the God that you are and praise and thank you for the rest of their lives. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, we are blessed people. And through sickness, there's still blessings. Through cancer, there's still blessings. Through surgeries, even through death, there are still blessings. Let's stand and sing this song, Come Thou Fount, because he is a fountain of many blessings. Come the fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus taught me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, brought with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Born to wander, Lord, I leave it. Born to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above.
you may be seated. <laughs> Join me in the offertory prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you today always with praise and thanksgiving, Lord, and I thank you for all that you have done for us and in us and through us. Father God, I pray that you will um, take these tithes and offerings that you've received today and use it for your glory. Use it to expand your kingdom and use it to let others know about your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father God, for every church in every corner of the nation of the world, Father God, as those tithes and offerings come in, bless them and use them to your glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. Thank you, choir. That's better. Oh, 
less, I know better. I can see you better now. <laughs> Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> and again, this is Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 13. When Jesus heard about it, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd, had compassion on them, and healed their sick. When evening came, the disciples approached him and said, This place is deserted, and it is already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. They don't need to go away, Jesus told them. You give them something to eat. But we only have five loaves and two small fish here, they said to him. Bring them here to me, he said. Then he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up twelve baskets full of leftover pieces. Now those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. And all God's people said, Amen, you may be seated. <clears throat> Back in my senior year of seminary, one of the classes that were required was called pastoral ministry. And the project for that class was to write a ministry plan for a fictitious church that you were fictitiously leading at the time. And uh, so I, having 30 years of business experience and an MBA, was all into writing business plans. And so I wrote this great business plan, and uh, then we all get up and we present it to the class, and I got up and presented my business plan, and I felt pretty good about it, and after a little Q&A, the professor raises his hand, and he says, David, nice plan, where is God in your plan? And it really struck me, and I still remember that to this day, because I was thinking business-minded, right? I'd written business plans before, and I had all the data and everything put together, but there was no mention of God throughout. And it was a great lesson to me, because without God in the business plan, without God in the ministry plan, there is no ministry plan. And so consequently, uh, we're going to see the same thing here with the disciples today. See, the disciples are faced with a problem. There's over 5,000 people and there's no food. And so they're going to say, make it go away, is their first reaction. Then they're going to try to argue it away. But what they don't realize is that Jesus is actually going to do the miracle through them. And you see, the challenges that we face may seem insurmountable, but that's only if we rely on our own resources and effort. If we will just let Jesus do the miracle through us, the problems and challenges will be solved beyond our imagination. And so, before we get into the heart of this reading today, I want to just set the context here from verses 13 and 14. It says, at first, when Jesus heard about it. Now, what is the it? Well, the it was in the previous reading from last week that John the Baptist had been executed by King Herod. All right, his, he was beheaded, and his disciples came to Jesus to tell him about it. And Jesus has now heard about the death of his cousin and his friend, uh, someone he admired greatly and loved, John the Baptist. And so with that, it says, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone, which is a, 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 a very reasonable response. You learn of the death of someone you love, and you just need some time away by yourself, maybe to pray and collect your thoughts. And he goes by boat. It gets him away from the crowd almost immediately. Remember, he's surrounded by people. He's there at the uh, Sea of Galilee, so he and the disciples get in the boat, and they head out to a remote place, it says, and he gets a little bit of relief. 
But it goes on to say, when the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. So the crowd doesn't want to let him go, and they go along the shore, and they follow to where he goes. Verse 14, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd. So the people followed him all the way around, even though he's trying to get away, trying to get some quiet time. As soon as he steps off the boat, there the people are again. And so what's his response now? Does he tell the disciples, boys, get back in the boat, we're getting out of here? No, not at all. It says, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. You see, despite his sorrow, Jesus still moves forward and serves the people. And that's going to be a big part of the lesson today, because the attitude of the disciples is very different. Their attitude is not one of serving, but one of trying to dismiss what they see as a problem. They want to see the problem go away. Yet Jesus knows what he's going to do, and it's going to be a miracle that he does through them. So let's start out with the heart of this uh, passage, verse 15, where the disciples want to make the problem go away. Verse 15 says, When evening came, the disciples approached him and said, This place is deserted, and it's already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. All right, so apparently Jesus has been healing the people all day, probably teaching them as well. It's beginning to get late. It's a deserted place. Remember, they took the boat off to a remote area. And now the disciples can foresee a problem coming. There are, from verse 21, 5,000 men plus women and children. So some commentators think it's as many as 15 or 20,000 people. And the disciples know that these people have been here all day, they're all going to get hungry, and they're all going to need food, and that is a problem that we just cannot deal with. And so consequently, their first response is, let's make this problem go away. So they go to Jesus and say, send the people away, let them go buy food for themselves. And their basic attitude is, your problem is not my problem. And I think that is one of the biggest issues that we have in our society today. It's not my problem. We all know there's problems in the world, but very few people are willing to step up and do something about it. It's not my problem. It's easier to say than to do the hard work to solve the problem. As I was reading through this, I was reminded of the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, A Christmas Carol. That might sound strange. Here it is June, it's 90 degrees, and I'm talking about Christmas Carol. But it's a great novel, and it has great lessons. At one part in the story, two men come to Scrooge's business, and they're looking for contributions for charity. They want to buy some food and some shelter for the poor. So they ask Ebenezer Scrooge, after they tell him their intent, how much can we put you down for? And Scrooge says, nothing. And they say, you wish to remain anonymous. He says, no, I wish to remain alone. And then he goes on to say, are there not prisons? Are there not workhouses? And they say, well, yeah, there are prisons and there are workhouses, but some people would rather not go there, some would even rather die. And he says, well, then let them die and decrease the surplus population. He goes on to say, I was concerned that the prisons might not be operating. He says, I pay taxes. It's the government's problem to deal with these people, not mine. It's not my problem, and he sends the men away. And that's the attitude that we have to avoid. Because there's all sorts of problems in the world. There are problems right here in the town of Cornelius. And I want you to think about that for a minute. That's the first thing, frankly, I want you to think about today. What problems are here in the town of Cornelius that need to get solved? That are here in our own mission field, right? From Highway 21 to Highway 115, half mile radius from this church, there's lots of problems. I want you to think about those problems. And then I want you to think about how we might address those problems rather than saying, it's not my problem, because it is our problem. Whatever's going on here in our mission field is something that we should address. 
Now, Jesus' response to the disciples comes in verse 16. After they ask him to send the crowds away, he responds, they don't need to go away. The answer to the problem is not to make the problem go away. The problem will still happen. So he says, you give them something to eat. He's telling them, this is your problem to solve. They're not going to go away. You give them something to eat. And now that they can't make the problem go away, the disciples are going to try to argue the problem away. They respond to Jesus, verse 17, but we only have five loaves and two fish here, they said to him. Now the first word I want you to take notice of is but. And as you're reading through your scripture and you're doing your Bible study, every time you see but, circle it, underline it, highlight it, put a smiley face next to it, whatever you want to do, just get focus on that word but. Because but is a very powerful word, particularly in scripture. And it generally is used in two different ways. The first way is to introduce a phrase or clause contrasting with what has already been said. So, for example, we were lost hopelessly in our trespasses and sin, but God made a way. That but leads to a contrasting phrase for something that previously seemed impossible. We were lost hopelessly in our trespasses and sins, but God made a way. The other way is to indicate the impossibility of anything other than what has already been said. And that's what we have here with the disciples. There's 5,000 people and five loaves and two fish, but that's all we have. All right? They're just re-emphasizing that it's impossible. 5,000 people plus women, men plus women and children, but we only have five loaves and two fish. And this is a very logical argument. Right? They, don't, they only have five loaves and two fish. Even Luke, when I told the kids, there's no way you're going to feed 5,000 people, or 5,000 men plus women and children, so maybe 20,000 people with just five loaves and two fish. They are absolutely correct within their own resources. The other Gospels add an additional argument They go on to say, even if we could go into town to buy food, it would take more than a half year of wages to buy just a little bit for everybody. they, They say 200 denarii, 200 days wages, just to give everybody a little bit. This is impossible. And the basic argument is, We don't have the food, we don't have the money, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources. We can't solve this problem because we don't have what we need to solve it. And that is very often the objection that is raised whenever we try to do something that can affect a change in the community. Throughout my almost seven years now, very often I've heard, we don't have the money, we don't have the people, and it might be a liability. Whenever we look to do things, those three objections almost always get raised. And those are valid objections. We don't have the money, we don't have the people, and it probably is a liability. Okay? But, God... So the next thing I would say is, as you were thinking about problems here in Cornelius, and what maybe could be done to correct those problems, what excuses jumped into your head? Why we aren't doing it? Maybe we don't have the people. Maybe we don't have the money. Maybe it's a liability. Those excuses are always going to come. But we only have five loaves and fish, rather than but God. And that's where Jesus now comes in. After they've tried to make the problem go away, after they have tried to argue the problem away, Jesus is going to do the miracle through them. Verse 18, Jesus says, Bring them here to me. Bring me the bread. 
Bring me the fish. Notice that Jesus waits until the disciples have made their argument that this is impossible. And they're right. It is impossible. It's impossible to feed 5,000 men plus women and children with five loaves of bread and two fish. They're absolutely correct. But if it weren't impossible, it wouldn't be a miracle. And Jesus was waiting for them to make that proof, and he's ready now to do what he's going to do. Jesus then says to the crowds, sit down on the grass. Now, why he says that, that's up to speculation. My thought is, he wants everybody to be able to see what's about to happen. There is 5,000 men, women, and children. He's standing there with these five loaves, two fish, and the 12 disciples. If everybody's standing up, not everybody's going to see. Sit down. You all need to see this. He then holds up the loaves and the fish so everybody can see. There's nothing up my sleeve, right? And he looks up to heaven and he gives thanks to God. And he blesses the food. And then he does something, I think, even more miraculous. He gives it back to the disciples. He gives it back to them. He doesn't give it to the crowds. He gives it to the disciples. He's re-emphasizing, you've had what you needed all along. You just didn't have faith. You now go give them something to eat. It's what I told you to do five minutes ago. But now you're going to do it. You give them something to eat. Stop looking at your lack. Look at my abundance. You see, Jesus doesn't bypass the church to do his miracles. Jesus does the miracles through the church when they act in faith. And it goes on to show the miracle. Everyone ate and was satisfied, verse 20. Everybody ate and was satisfied. 15, 20,000 people, all of them fed, full bellies, five loaves, two fish. Miracle of Jesus. But more than that, they picked up 12 baskets full of leftover pieces. One basket for every disciple. Just to remind them of Jesus' abundance. You see, Jesus is more than enough if we just rely on him in faith. As I was writing this sermon, I was thinking about the things that this church has accomplished over the years. And we've accomplished a lot. When people come and ask me, what is the thing that you're most proud of, I almost always say that we helped to start two more churches. See, church planting is a big thing. I was talking to a guy from Lake Forest uh, just Friday, and uh, he was telling me about their church planting strategy, how they you know, start another church in different areas and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and that's, that's a big church kind of mentality to try to plant a church somewhere else, right? But we actually are incubating churches, I would say. Right? We're giving them a place to hatch and grow. Revive Iglesia Christiana, which meets here in the morning, came about because God brought me and Pastor Carlos together down in uh, Charlotte at the Metrolina Baptist uh, Pastor's Dinner. It was December of 2018. Christy and I walked into the dinner late. Everybody was already seated. We went to the first table we saw that had empty seats. As soon as we sat down, we realized everybody was speaking Spanish. <clears throat> now, fortunately, Pastor Carlos does speak some English, too, and so we got to talking and he told me that he lived in Cornelius. And he says, I have a church in Charlotte, but I've always wanted to open a church in Cornelius. I said, we have a building. Maybe we can make it work. And by January, just six weeks later, Revive Iglesia Cristiana opened up because this church incubated that church. So that's something to be proud of. We bring together the local churches to worship, the Singspirations, some of you may have been to, the Thanksgiving services, the four-church worship service, which will be in two weeks. And I, we've got bigger plans even coming for the end of the year with the other churches. 
We have witnessed to hundreds of children in VBS. And we're having a combined VBS this August. We've done all kinds of festivals. We've done events for the community. We opened our doors uh, during COVID for Camp Advantage, if you all remember that. Camp Advantage, 30 kids, four days a week, getting fed lunch, thanks mostly to West Joplin. They were tutored, served, had a safe learning environment for kids who didn't otherwise have internet access at home. That was huge. Huge. We did that for six months. We have COVID vaccination clinics. We got COVID testing still going on. Another one. Back when COVID first happened, Manny Rosado called me up. Manny Rosado from the Neighborhood Care Center. He says, we got a problem. He says, all these kids who are now not being able to go to school are not getting fed because these kids relied on the free lunch program. So we got together in the fellowship hall and started making sandwiches. We made 100 sandwiches every day for a week. The resources came from other places. People donated food. People donated their time. But it all started in here. Then, see, uh, Charlotte Knuckleberg Schools took over providing the lunches, and we distributed it. Now, and beginning this Tuesday, every week until school begins, Angels and Sparrows will make 200 sandwiches that folks from the care center will go pick up and distribute to all the kids throughout Cornelius who need lunch. That's huge. That's Jesus doing a miracle through the church and providing the resources from out there in the mission field. The angel tree is the same thing. Right? The care center came to us a few years ago and said, I got 30 kids who need Christmas gifts. Can your church help? I said, yes. We collected 90 gifts that year. Every kid got three gifts, and those kids were satisfied. The next year, Manny calls me up and says, we have 100 kids this time. Okay? So he started getting other churches involved. Last year, they had 200 kids, and all of those kids got gifts. Because Jesus worked through the churches, ours and others included, and were able to serve the community. We have opened our doors to blood drives, food distribution, all sorts of community events. And we've also ministered to our own people through prayers and praise and Bible study and Sunday school and children's church and benevolence programs. We have done a lot in just a few years. But you know what? We can do bigger things. If you recall the sermon about the mustard seed not long ago, mustard seed, Jesus said, the smallest seed, but it grows into a great big bush, so big that the birds of the air can live in it. Our mustard seed, in my opinion, has germinated, and it's looking pretty good, but it can be much bigger. So I want you to think about it. What is the potential of the mustard seed that is First Baptist Church? How far can we expand the kingdom of God if we just stop looking at our own resources and look to Jesus to do the miracle through us? Because we can't try to make the problems go away as the disciples did. We can't make excuses about resources. We simply need to trust in Jesus to provide and make the miracle happen through this church. So as you leave today, I want you to think about problems in Cornelius that need to be solved. I want you to cast aside the excuses. I want you to give thanks to God for everything he's given to us so far. And then let Jesus do the miracle through us. And all God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> There's so much that can be done by faith in Jesus. It's immeasurable. Right? If Jesus can feed fifteen to 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish, he can do anything. He can do anything. We know that. The most important thing he does 
is bring about salvation. The reason we do things, and let me make this real clear, we can feed every person in Cornelius. We can put a shirt on their back. We can build a house for them. We can do whatever. If we don't tell them about Jesus, we failed. The mission is the envelope in which the invitation to salvation is delivered. And that's why we do the invitation every Sunday. Because this is most important. Salvation comes only through Jesus Christ and your faith in him. And so each Sunday after the sermon, we do the invitation, the altar call, whatever you want to call it, because there's no other way. If you've never given your life to Christ, do it today. I'll be here, David will play, you all will be singing, hopefully praying, and come forward and give your life to Christ. If you have a prayer request or something you want to share with me, you're welcome to come forward for that. If you want to become a member of this church, come forward and make that intention known. And then we can vote on you in two weeks, like uh, Diana said. But first and foremost, if you've never given your life to Christ, I beg you to do so today. David. Let's stand and join our hearts together as we sing, He Leadeth Me, 690 in your hymn book. He leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort thought. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content, whatever what I see, still tis the hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. Heavenly Father, I ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon these people. Lord God, open their eyes and their ears, but mostly their hearts, that they would see all that is out there in our small town, just called Cornelius, Lord. All the many needs and sufferings that could be resolved if we just let the miracle be worked by you. So, Father God, give us hearts for the people, and let us lead each and every one, man, woman, and child, to know you through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen.